welcome everyone on this Saturday morning to the second webinar in our series on what women want at 40. And the second one, we're going to be talking about bone health today um, and looking at, at risk of osteoporosis and how women can really take control um, of, their, of their risk of osteoporosis and, and look at prevention as well. So this is I just wanted to remind everyone that this series is jointly collaborated with Access Health International and WINGS um, and really looking at how we can continue to support women um, in, their, in, their, uh, in their personal health and, and life changes during this decade. Um, I'm going to kick off the, the discussion today right away by introducing Dr. Manju Chandran who is a senior consultant at the Department of Endocrinology and a senior consultant and director of the Osteoporosis and Bone Metabolism Unit at Singapore General Hospital. And Dr. Manju is going to be giving us an overview of osteoporosis and bone health um, and, and providing this framework on how we think about how we think about our bone health. So Dr. Manju, turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Adrian. So I guess I start sharing my screen. Uh... One second. Uh, okay, so everyone can see my screen, right? Yeah, this seems to be the introduction that all Zoom meetings <laughs> begin with. Well, thank you so much, um, Adrian and Ivan, um, uh, for inviting me to speak um, uh, today. I'm sorry, I got a little bit uh, muddled up. I thought it starts at 11, so it was like this frantic rush, which women 40 and above um, always know. You know, we are always rushing about from uh, here and there. So, but anyway, let me start. So, uh, 40... Just yeah. really quickly, is I think we might be looking at a different screen. Hmm. No, this is fine. This is fine. This is it. This okay. is it. Okay. This is how I'm going to start. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Sorry about <laughs> I that. I like yeah. to start with a little twist always. So, so 40 is a very important number, whether you're looking at religions or whether looking at the world at, at large. Um, 40 is an extremely important number. So whether it be Judaism or Christianity or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, the word, the number 40 has got very important implications. Um, and if you can, if you can see, I mean, the number, the, 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 the type is rather small, but uh, you can, there are hundreds and hundreds of references to the number 40 uh, um, uh, throughout history as well as in current times. But unfortunately, the number 40 has got a negative connotation at the moment uh, because we think that 40, we, we start saying by 40 is over the hill, etc. So should it be like that? It shouldn't be, right? So what I'm going to be titling my talk today is Fabulous at 40, Before 40 and Beyond 40, You and Your Bone Health. And I saw 40 several moons ago, okay? So I really am the fabulous way beyond 40. But for the younger people out here, 40 is not the end all. 40 is a new beginning. So those of you who thought that bone is a dead tissue, you're dead wrong. Bones are living tissues and constantly in a state of turnover, making mineral deposits and withdrawals daily. So from the time that we are born till the day we drop dead, our bones are constantly breaking down and reforming every single day, every single minute of our lives. And so I like to think of it as uh, uh, two important uh, little workers sitting inside our body and uh, doing this uh, deconstruction, reconstruction. The bone destruction workers are called osteoclasts. These osteoclasts, these are the, the construction workers, these are the, the deconstruction workers. What they do is they remove old bone and you know the osteoblasts are the, the little, little cells, the little men inside, which form new bones. So this goes on throughout our lives. And if you look at the bone uh, through a microscope, this is what you're going to be seeing. You're going to be seeing this constant formation, constant process of bone destruction and bone formation happening. And so if you were to look at our curve of how bone uh, remodeling happens, 
90% of adult bone mass is in place by the end of adolescence. So by the end of about, you know, 1920 um, years of age, you've achieved 90% of your adult bone mass. And peak bone mass is usually achieved around the ages of but between, let's say, about 24 to 30 years old. So after that, I really don't like to call it going downhill, but yes, after the age of about 30 to 35, you start losing bone a little bit more than how much bone you're forming. So bone mass in later life, this part, how much bone you have in later life depends upon the peak bone mass achieved during growth and the rate of subsequent age-related bone loss. So those people who manage to build up a good peak bone mass in the early years, obviously they're going to have a bigger bone bank when they hit their 35s and 40s. And of course, some people, unfortunately, you uh, lose more bone than others in later life. And so obviously those people are the ones who are going to be more affected by um, osteoporosis. Now, I do want to emphasize on a caveat, though these days we are switching away from a negative perspective perception of everything and and saying that you know you can prevent uh, um, um, uh, diseases such as osteoporosis completely by changing your lifestyle and a diet, etc. That's probably not entirely correct. Only about twenty percent of your uh, bone mass and bone quality is determined uh, by environmental factors such as lifestyle and diet. More than eighty percent of it is genetic, but still, that twenty percent you can do a lot to help build up that part of uh, your. Or, uh, bone structure and bone density. So changes in BMD with age. So like I said, bone density peaks around 20 to 30 years of age. And as if you can compare between men and women, men about the age of 50 at most, they also do suffer from age-related decline in bone, um, um, strength and bone quality. At most, the bone density in men more than 50 years, it decreases about 0.2 to 0.5% per year. Whereas after menopause, when we lose a protective female hormone called estrogen, you're going to get a decrease of 3 to 5% percent per year for the first five to eight years after menopause. And then after that, it slows down a little bit. It comes down to about one to two percent per year thereafter. So the first few years after menopause are critical because you're going to lose quite a significant amount of bone. And some people more than others, obviously. So that brings me to the topic of what is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis simply means porous bones. It's weak and brittle bones caused by bone loss. And obviously, it predisposes a bone to fracture. So osteoporosis occurs. Remember, I was talking about this process of remodeling. You're having bone formation and bone loss happening throughout the lives. Osteoporosis occurs when the process that removes old bone and replaces it with new bone becomes balanced. So normally in our human bodies, this is a very happy couple process. The process of bone formation and bone destruction is a very happy couple process. It's a marriage made in heaven. And I think, I mean, for, pardon my, my atrocious uh, Chinese, but uh, a marriage made in heaven, it's tian uh, zuo um, So it's basically the phoenix and the dragon, they are in perfect unison, but osteoporosis happens when there is a divorce, when there's an uncoupling between um, bone formation and, and bone resorption. So bone removal more than bone formation, obviously that equates to bone loss. So a simple-minded person like me, I like to think of it as, you know, remember I was talking to you about the, the, the construction workers, uh, the, the osteoclasts who destruct bone and the osteoblasts that form new bone. So normal bone turnover, the construction workers are very happy. They're, they're sitting and working in unison. But this is what happens in osteoporosis when there's complete mayhem. Resorption or bone loss exceeds bone formation. And it doesn't take rocket science to figure that what you see on the left side of the screen is normal bone in which what we call the trabiculae. These are like, it's like a, if you look at the bone from uh, through a microscope, it's a very tight honeycomb. So you can see that normal bone is very tight. The trabiculae are very tight, sorry. Uh, whereas in the bone with osteoporosis, the trabiculae are far wider spaced apart and they're 
much thinner. And obviously, it doesn't again take rocket science to figure that this bone with osteoporosis is going to be more fragile. So what happens when you have osteoporosis? Now, this is a problem, right? Osteoporosis is a silent disease. You may not even know that you have osteoporosis, still you have a fracture. And this is why it's so important that we speak up for it you know, and increase awareness about osteoporosis because we may not know that we have osteoporosis till you suffer a fracture. You might be just picking up 40 years old. I don't think you'll be picking up your grandchildren, but let's say you're 50, 60, and you're, you're just picking up your grandchild. You could suffer from a rib fracture. If you have severe osteoporosis, a cough, a violent cough can actually uh, cough a, 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 a backbone or a rib fracture. And just a fall, you might be walking along, minding your own business, you slip on a banana peel and you fall and you fall with your outstretched hand, you might end up breaking your wrist or you could fall on your side, you could have a hip fracture. So this is a problem with osteoporosis. So what is a fragility fracture? A, fra a fragility fracture is a fracture that happens with very minimal trauma. Like I said, the instances that are just recounted just now, or even spontaneously, you may not even know. I mean, you, 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 you may not even recall having any major trauma or falling or anything like that. But often we see patients who present to us with backbone or spine fractures, and they can't even recall anything, any major trauma that happened. So fractures could happen spontaneously. So how could you possibly kind of tell that maybe you might have a silent vertebral fracture? So all of us, as we grow older, we lose height, but about two to three centimeter of height loss is okay as we grow older. But if you have lost more than about four to five centimeter compared to your peak adult height, which is probably around the ages of 25 to 30, that could mean, not always, it could mean that um, there is a silent vertebral or backbone fracture which compresses your spine. So obviously you're going to lose height. So more than four to five centimeters of height loss compared to your peak adult height could suggest that you have a vertebral or a, that is a spine fracture. Um, sorry, why isn't this more? Yeah, so can you predict can you see a fracture in your future when you look at the when you gaze at the crystal ball can you tell whether you're going to be having a fracture not always but there are some what we call modifiable risk factors which are associated with bone loss and fractures age obviously like i said as you grow older you're going to lose bone I mean, and some people lose more bone than others of course but age by itself is a big risk factor the older you are the, the higher you are at risk for having osteoporosis and fragility fractures just by being female I presume the audience today is most likely all female, except probably Ivan, but just being a female puts you at risk of having osteoporosis and fragility fractures. Being very small and thinly built, that also puts you at risk. Early menopause, usually the average age of menopause is around 46 to 50, but some people who have early menopause, because then you're losing your protective hormone called estrogen much earlier. If you have a strong family history of osteoporosis and fractures, that puts you at risk too, because obviously you can't change your families. A previous history of fracture, now this is very important, a previous history of fracture puts you at risk of having another fracture if you don't get treated. Um, so that's why we say fractures beget fractures. And on the right-hand side, all these are also risk factors. Smoking is very bad for your bones. Drinking more than about three units of alcohol per day, and people might ask me, hey, what is one unit of alcohol? One unit of alcohol is about 10 ml. So one small glass of wine is about 1.5 units. So you kind of get what I mean. Excessive co co coffee intake. Caffeine can leach calcium from your bones and into the urine and you can lose calcium. And then, of course, uh, there is another condition called secondary osteoporosis, which I'll talk about in a second. So now, this is a very, there are simple tools which can help predict whether you are at risk of having osteoporosis. Uh, and if you were to go and get a bone density test, whether that will show that you have osteoporosis. One of them is called the OSTA score, which is Osteoporosis Self Assessment Tool Nations. And now this can be used only for post menopausal uh, women. Okay. So this essentially depends on the fact that remember what I said the older you are and the thinner you are, the chances that you'll have osteoporosis is higher. So if you subtract your weight from your age, if that's more than 20, so age minus weight is if it's more than 20, then 
may suggest that you are at risk for having osteoporosis, so you should probably go and get a bone density test. And that that it's very likely that it may show osteoporosis if your score is more than 20. So for example, a 65-year-old postmenopausal woman, if she weighs only 43 kilograms, so 65 minus 43 is 22, that could kind of puts you at high risk. So this is kind of one of the ways by which you can quickly tell. Now, the IOF, the International Osteoporosis Foundation, if you go to their website, IOF, International Osteoporosis Foundation, they have a very simple, what's called a one-minute risk test, which even people above the age of 40 can use. Okay, so it's, it's called a one-minute osteoporosis risk test. You just click, 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 you know, you just stick these risk factors, whether or not you have it. And at the end, it'll give you uh, what your risk of having osteoporosis is. So these are simple tools by which you, yourself, can kind of uh, predict whether you're at risk for osteoporosis. So we often say um, that osteoporosis is a pe uh, pediatric disease with geriatric outcomes. Now, why do I say that? Remember what I was telling you about that peak uh, bone uh, mass is achieved by the age of about 20 to 25. 90% of bone mass is achieved by the time you finish your adolescence. So those critical Critical adolescent years, growing up childhood and adolescent years are very critical. And if you are, you know, if your kid is one of those kids who are sitting at home, not exercising, sitting and playing on the computer all day long, um, and not taking a good healthy diet. Um, people with anorexia, they are at very high risk for um, osteoporosis uh, in subsequent years. So that's why we call it osteoporosis is a pediatric disease with geriatric outcomes. And remember what I earlier said about secondary osteoporosis. Now, these are obviously conditions that you are not obviously, you know, the, the lay person may not be qualified, but your doctor, when you present to him being checked out for osteoporosis, and if you have had a fracture, the doctor will run these tests, will also take a detailed history to find out whether you have any condition which can lead to osteoporosis, which can secondarily lead to osteoporosis, and that's called secondary osteoporosis. Several conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, um, too much calcium, you know, in, in the blood. It's from a condition called hyperparathyroidism, and too much, you know, or an overactive thyroid gland, um, um, or leaking too much calcium in your urine. All these are conditions which can result in secondary osteoporosis. Diabetes by itself is a risk factor for osteoporosis and osteoporotic fragility fractures. And then there are these medicines which um, you are, you may you will have to be on them for other conditions. So I'm not saying that you should get off these medicines, but your doctor will be aware of this and will kind of manage you accordingly. Steroid medications, which are often used for conditions like asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, etc., long term. Okay, this can put you at risk for osteoporosis. Um, breast cancer medicines. Again, if you have breast cancer, you have to take the medicine, right? But again, your doctor will know that this is a medicine that is associated with bone loss. So lab tests may be needed to rule out secondary osteoporosis. Now, the last part of my talk, um, um, I'm just going to be briefly mentioning because I know the other speakers are, are going to be talking about diet and exercise. So like I said, not all osteoporosis is preventable. 80% of it is determined by genetics, um, 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 but 20% of it can be modulated by lifestyle and diet changes. So obviously have a healthy diet, avoid harmful agents. Like I said, smoking is bad for you. If you smoke like a chimney, obviously that, that's gonna be very bad for your osteoporosis. Uh, for your bone health, too much caffeine, very high salt content. In Singapore, one of the things that we found when we did our research was that um, hypercalciuria, which is leaking too much calcium in your urine, is quite prevalent in our population. We think it's because of the very high salt content in our diet. Um, there's so many hidden sources of salt, so which uh, I'm sure the dietitian can, uh, the nutritionist can talk to you about that. And exercise, of course, is important. So basically, feed your bones right. And you know, this is in my demented kind of uh, 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 one of the nights I sat and drew up this cartoon. But so essentially, feed your bones right. And so, are you taking so calcium? People often talk about calcium, calcium, calcium. Yes, calcium is good for the bones, um, and it's more important during your younger years peak um, uh, when you're trying to attain your peak uh, bone mass and at your later stages of course taking a calcium rich diet is very important for your bones and again the nutritionist will talk to you about it but adolescents in general need at least about 1000 milligrams of calcium and again it, uh, the adults 51 years and above also need about 1000 milligrams of calcium in their daily um, uh, intake um, so calcium alone does not protect your bones. You need vitamin D is needed for calcium absorption. 
And there are two sources of vitamin D, right? So dietary sources, now it's very hard to get uh, vitamin D from the diet. You will have to eat like kilos worth of salmon, et cetera, to get uh, the required amount of uh, vitamin D from your diet. But there are sources of food which are good in, in vitamin D, um, oily fish like salmon, egg yolks, fortified milk, um, uh, cheese, mushrooms are good sources of vitamin D. Um, and again, the nutritionist can share with you, I'm sure, about good sources of vitamin D. But the most important source of vitamin D is from sunshine. And um, I do emphasize to people that people say, oh, I do get sunshine. And when I ask them, what time do you go out and you know run and exercise and all that, they say, oh, it's in the early morning. Now, unfortunately, if, you want, if you're going out to get vitamin D, um, it has to be during the hours of 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. because it's during that time that the particular ultraviolet B light, which makes... Uh, uh, vitamin D on your skin, um, that's when that particular spectrum of ultraviolet uh, light is produced by the sun. So it's between the hours of 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. But, you know, unfortunately, I mean, you know, most of us are so scared of the sun and, and you know, Asians, especially we want, you know, very fair skin. So we are always going out with umbrellas and um, et cetera, et cetera. But, and I tell my patients, it's not like you have to go out and sunbathe and stand out in the sun. Just maybe go, you know, tap out your food and, you know, take it out and around, you know, 12, 12, 15, just go and sit outside, you know, and, you know, have a quick bite, 10 to 15 minutes, especially for Chinese, uh, 10 to 15 minutes of sun exposure for about uh, three or four times a week is more than enough to get the required amount of vitamin D. For darker skin people like me being Indian, I would need a little bit longer exposure, probably about 20 minutes plus um, or so. Um, so between the hours of 10 and 3 a.m. Okay, 3 p.m. I'm sorry. So there are other important nutrients like protein, vitamin K, zinc, magnesium, etc. But please, you know, I get often um, uh, barraged with questions saying, should I be taking magnesium supplements? Should I be taking zinc supplements, etc.? If you have a well-balanced diet, these nutrients are present in your diet. So a well-balanced diet is more than enough. Uh, you don't have to go take extra zinc, extra magnesium, etc. Um, exercise, again, I will not uh, um, talk too much about it because, you know, I know we have a wonderful speaker who's going to be talking about it, but exercise is strongly recommended, what we call weight-bearing exercises, which means that putting the weight of your body on your bones, but unfortunately, again, and moms of Teenagers know this, right? Um, how difficult it is to get them out exercising. And uh, um, so my teenagers, uh, he's woken up this morning and uh, he's happy that I'm sitting here talking to you because I am not bothering him. He's sitting and playing on the computer. So it's very difficult, but this is important. Exercise is important. Last bit, treatment. Obviously, this is a public forum. I'm not going to be talking about specific treatments at all, but the sad part is that osteoporosis is underdiagnosed and under treated. So this is something that has to change. Um, so what does treatment do? Remember I said osteoporosis is when the process of bone formation and bone resorption go un uh, unbalanced. So medications act by either reducing bone loss or enhancing bone formation. So have a discussion with your doctor. Suppose, I mean, so like I said, I mean, unfortunately, in spite of all this, people might still get osteoporosis and fragile fractures. So you need to be picked up and treated early. So talk to your doctor about which medicine is right for you. Obviously, a public forum is not a place where I can discuss individual medications and uh, treatment for individual patients. So that's pretty much it, folks. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I've set the stage for the next couple of uh, um, talks and uh, just to get the fear of turning 40 um, out of your heads. 40 is really fabulous. I can attest to it. Um, I am 52. So um, I've seen 40 and I've seen 50 now and I, I think they're all great ages. It's just that you have to take it with the right spirit. And I think you can have very strong bones which can last you all the way till... Uh, um, at the very end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manju. I think that was, um, you know, very comprehensive and informative um, presentation on osteoporosis. And what's especially helpful is looking at some of these some of these factors, um, lifestyle factors, and things we can do in our 40s to support bone health. And you know, when I'm I'm also I'm in my 40s, so um, you know, it's helpful for those reminders for for me as well. And I think a lot of times. Osteoporosis is something that we start to talk about when a woman goes through menopause, 
It's something that is, you know, right when we start talking about, okay, you could fall any day, or this is rather than saying when women are younger, before the full risk is there, how do we support women to take care of themselves now? Um, you know, as a mother of small children, I definitely live off of caffeine, but the, (laughs) but but what are the other things that we can do so that it doesn't feel like we're on this, this cliff edge at menopause and, and the messaging that all of a sudden all these things happen. Um, so, so I think this is a really good reminder of how we can take charge of our, of our health in our forties. Um, and what are these small things that we can do, um, to support bone health? So Um, You know, going to our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Melina Supia Covert, who's the Deputy Director of Clinical Education at the National University Health System. And she's going to be talking about more of the nutritional aspects of how we support bone health. So passing it over to you, Dr. Melina. Um, Thank you, Adrian. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manju, as well for setting the stage. Uh, It makes my job that much easier. So all the definitions of osteoporosis have been done and uh, how it affects us as we age. Before I share my screen, just a quick poll and you can type it into the chat group. How many of you in the audience actually have broken a bone or any part of the body? Seeing that for osteoporosis, the most high risk areas would be spine, wrist, Yeah, hip, broken wrist, yes. Anyone else with any bits and pieces that have sort of started to fall apart or in pain? No one else? Next, good, thankfully. Oh no, three bones at once. Whoa, (laughs) That's... that's bad. I hope it's all mended now. Um, Next question, how many of you um, do cook your own meals? Just put a Y or an N for yes or no. Okay, so quite a fair bit of persons are actually in charge. The reason I ask is all about control. What you put in your body is in your control if you are able to cook it most times because you know the quality of the ingredients, especially the oil that is used. Yeah. Okay. There's a foot fracture from cycling from Viv Chua. Okay. Thank you very much. So after that short poll, I'll start sharing my screen. Oh, here we go. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah. So this is a um, piece of art that um, I particularly like. I used to actually live uh, and work in Vienna in Austria. And one of the main artists apart from Kokoschka and Sheila is actually Gustav Klimt. But this particular painting is in a museum that is in Rome, in another town that I used to work in um, at the UN Food and Agricultural Organization and World Food Program. So Rome in the Galleria Nazionale d'Arte Moderna has the three ages of women. If you look carefully, not only is it a pretty picture, but it's pretty real when you look at the child, so-called mother and the mother of the mother in the painting. And you will see that um, skin, hair, stance are pretty representative of what we can expect as we grow older. But um, we don't all age at the same speed and we don't all um, have high risk for osteoporosis. So what can we do to slow it down We can't prevent it completely, especially if most of us are going to be destined to live to at least 90 or 100. So it's actually something that's going to happen anyway because of our hormonal changes, as Dr. Manju said, as of 46 onwards or 50 for some. And how are we going to mitigate that risk? How are we going to live our lives? So most times we are looking at 
health span rather than lifespan. How long can we live healthily, right? Not be on dialysis or anything like that. So basically, why do we eat? Physiological needs, right? We need water to be hydrated. We need food to be strong and healthy. And in the food groups, we have the micro, macronutrients, which are protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And then all the micronutrients that we were talking about, um, whether it's you know phosphorus, zinc, uh, cobalt, and the salt that we eat as well. They, we don't eat them in large quantities, unlike the other three big groups. The other reason we eat is for social cultural needs. And I stress upon this because people who age on their own, who are not with their families and leading more lonely existences, it's much harder if they don't um, have a strong social and cultural support because if um, they're on their own, there's more likely um, that they will not feed themselves that well. They're not looked after. So generally, um, do surround yourselves. Meals are happy moments to be shared with others and festivals and birthdays are always great times to find ourselves in front of good food. The last one obviously is for pleasure. So we do know that people who are on a nasogastric tube do not have much pleasure in eating. It's a survival mode. The physiological need su supersedes all the other needs, right? They're in probably a hospital bed. They're not eating at a table with friends and family. And there's definitely not much pleasure because they're not actually tasting it. So it's very important to go back to the fundamentals of why we eat and uh, recreate these moments, recreate these spaces and circumstances so that Eating is a happy and joyful time. Cooking as well, as we mentioned earlier, if you do like shopping for your ingredients or going marketing, tossing a, up a salad, you know, changing your sauce or trying out new recipes, that's very good for you because that excitement and interest in food is, uh, I would say, prime people who suffer from anorexia or bulimia or other eating disorders are completely off food or they binge and then they sort of make themselves throw up and therefore not enjoying all the reasons for which we actually want to eat and be well. So a basic balanced diet is all the various components that we spoke about earlier on, macronutrients, that give you the building blocks, your protein, the fat that are in uh, necessary also for neural transmission in your myelin sheath and your brain, uh, as well as cholesterol. Our liver actually produces up to 75, 80% of the cholesterol that we need. So although cholesterol seems like a vilified component in your bloodstream, a lot of it is produced by the body and absolutely necessary. What we do worry about is the ratio of low density um, lipoprotein, which is so-called bad cholesterol, to the lipoprotein, which is the good cholesterol. So keeping the high density lipoprotein high in that ratio is important, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. So you see in this picture um, milk, uh, dairy products in the form of cheese. Those of you who love uh, fermented dairy products like yogurt, that's lovely too. Um, fish, eggs, uh, different types of oils, and lots of vegetables, fruit. And for those of you who are uh, omnivorous, who actually eat meat as well, rather than uh, on a vegetarian diet, there's so many meats that are available to you, either um, in, in its form like this or cured in the forms of hams and uh, various other preparations. So we spoke about longevity and uh, how health span is more important than lifespan, or at least that's what we're looking towards. We don't want to be on dialysis for 30 years before we pass on. Apart from being such a, a pain to live like that, it's a high cost to society, to the people who care for you, and uh, for you know the, the government that takes care of us. So for every, dollars spent, we want it to go to the ones who are in need the most, 
And therefore, we try and see how we can have a proper health span rather than just a long life, but not a great quality of life. This allows me to segue into something called the blue zones. So these were six zones um, identified across the world. It wasn't an actual study. It was done by a journalist by the name of Dan Butner, a National Geographic journalist. And he noticed across the world, just in normal epidemiology and the demographics, where people lived to over a hundred without, you know, any special sort of healthcare needs or medication. What he did notice that they were actually healthy and happy, which goes into our health span um, definition. And 20% could have been attributed to their genes, their genetic makeup but 80% was all about lifestyle. So these um, blue zones were identified in Icaria, Greece, Loma Linda in California, Sardinia in Italy, which is an island, Okinawa, another island, but this time not in the Mediterranean, Nicoya in Costa Rica, which is Central America, okay? So um, this is a picture of Icaria. So very uh, idyllic, um, blue waters, blue sky, uh, boats out in the marina, and everybody wants to just dine al fresco under the umbrellas. And as Dr. Manju said, perhaps spend 10 to 15 minutes outside of the huge umbrella so that you get your dose of the proper um, UV that you need for your vitamin D. So what they noticed in the blue zones was this. People with healthy and social circles and also eating nuts in the pink circle and whole grains and were culturally um, not isolated, fava beans, polyphenols from wines, and then the high soya consumption in Japan and that lack of stress or urgency, not that they were, you know, taking their own sweet time about things, but there was an ability to control their time rather than be uh, hamsters on a wheel, yeah, because stress, just like insufficient sleep, but we're not covering that today for osteoporosis. These are the things that lead to poor health or ill health if we don't eat well, move well, sleep well or rest well, as well as manage our stress and any form of addiction, whether it's um, alcohol, tobacco, gambling. So they noticed that the intersection of the three circles where people eat legumes, plant-based diet, consistent and moderate physical activity, family oriented social engagement with no smoking, empowered women, woohoo, we want that, sunshine and gardening was um, sort of like the recipe to longevity and healthy uh, lifespan. So nutrients that become especially important as we age, we said protein because they're the building blocks, because we tend to lose muscle mass, vitamin D, calcium, vitamin 12, especially if we are vegans and don't have um, any form of uh, intake for that particular vitamin, and vitamin C and E, which are actually antioxidants. So in protein comes, normally we think of meat, yeah? So um, the average adult loses three to 8% of their muscle mass each decade after 30. Another fact, protein from eggs is actually very cheap if we do eat eggs and we're not uh, vegans. So a protein rich diet could help uh, fight sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle, muscle mass. And research shows that you may get the most benefits if you combine a protein rich diet with resistant exercise, which um, Holly will be speaking to you about and Dr. Manju just now explaining uh, weight bearing exercises. So fatty fish uh, found in omega-3 uh, omega found in fatty fish um, is very good for you. So apart from the fish, if you notice like a um, very modest can of sardines actually has gone through what we call appetization. That means the tins have been um, heated to a high temperature and then sealed. Quite often the bones of these fish are actually edible. They actually crumble. So that's a lovely source of calcium as well. So if you eat fatty fish in that form, uh, in mackerel, sardine or salmon, it's very good for you because not only do you get your essential fatty acids, but you also get the calcium that is, you know, nice, um, easy to eat. 
The Mediterranean diet obviously has been touted, you know, for its various oils, vegetables, seafood, um, for all its benefits. And uh, we should be able to consume green leafy vegetables. And that comes in the form of kale and spinach and various salads. Lentils, nuts and seeds as well, especially when we're vegetarian, are very important uh, for our bone health and our health in general. It is also a great source of roughage. If you look at these beans and seeds, they have an outer skin and uh, inside, apart from tetracyclosaccharides or carbohydrates that are inside in the cotyledons of these beans, you have also a lot of roughage and fiber, which is extremely important for good intestinal transit. So whilst we speak of the Mediterranean diet, we're living in Asia, we should also, you know, look towards what's affordable, what's in season, what can we get from the markets. So local produce in the forms of yams, the nice um, sweet potatoes that are purple. So all colorful food, especially with anthocyanins, um, and, and various colors are good for you. Not only are they, you know, health protective, but they're absolutely delicious. So look around in your markets, your supermarkets. Um, and I don't think uh, any form of frozen food is that much worse than fresh food. So if you do uh, are stuck and need to get, you know, good frozen food, please do so. Um, it is almost just as good if not uh, better at times because certain like peas are harvested and um, the pea freezing factory is less than two hours away from the fields. So the nutrients and uh, vitamin content is extremely high rather than something that's been transported, brought to the shelves, bought home and then sits in your fridge for another two weeks, yeah? So you can see that um, there is no hard and fast rule about fresh versus frozen. Seafood and seaweed as well. Um, and don't forget your fermented foods that are extremely good if you want to enhance the flora of your uh, gut, uh, the microbiome. So here is a short video on bone health and nutrition. For those of you who are visual um, learners, this may be helpful rather than listening to me lecture on and on, yeah? So just watch this. I hope I get it right. I'll have to uh, perhaps stop share for a while and go to here. Ah, uh, there we go. And then mm, share again. Can everyone see the screen? Getting the right nutrients to build and strengthen your bones may be easier than you think. In fact, you may already be eating many bone-friendly ingredients in your daily diet. Do you recognize any of these? If you are not consuming enough of these foods, start introducing them into your meals and remember, dairy is a key source of calcium and protein, fish is a great source of protein and vitamin D, and some fruits and vegetables contain calcium and other nutrients that make your bones smile. No matter what your age, good nutrition helps to keep your skeleton strong and fracture-free. So make sure you eat the right foods and serve up bone strength. So that was short and sweet um, and hopefully um, impactful. Now I'll go back to this and there we go. So the guidelines. The broadcast is now starting. Oh, All dear. attendees are in listen yeah. only mode. Well, I think I have to stop there again. Good morning, good evening, and Sorry. welcome to the webinar on the pharmacological treatments for osteoporosis. Oh, dear. My name is Masaki Fujita, and I'm the science project coordinator at the International Osteoporosis Foundation in Switzerland. I'm also the Capture the Fracture program coordinator. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'll go back to the Zoom and screen share without extra voices trying to help me in my presentation. Uh, there we go. Okay, after that short interlude and uh, some form of entertainment, 
we go back to the calcium um, recommendations. I think Dr. Manju had it earlier on, and we all sort of agree on the 1,000 milligrams per day. Um, and if you were to take calcium supplements, just know that <clears throat> read the, the label, calcium carbonate often to be taken with meals to op optimize absorption. Whereas if you take uh, the citrate form, it can be taken anytime, yeah? No, no big deal. Most of them are, you know, very easily absorbed and uh, you will get the, what you need and whatever you do not um, absorb will just be flushed out in your urine, right? So vitamin, uh, oh no, this is the same, sorry. I'll have to, this is wrong. I will go back for the vitamin D. Um, so for vitamin D, it was discussed earlier on that um, I didn't I didn't check that. Sorry, now my phone is ringing. I got more more noise now. Um, apart from uh, it's a fat soluble vitamin, so it would come in capsules that look like your cod liver oil and things like that. Um, you would you would take up to one or two, depending on your age, depending on what. Um, how, how easily you take to that. Some people don't do so well. They prefer injections of vitamin D in one go. Um, they have been uh, um, sort of uh, prescribed by their doctors. If you do um, want to have a natural source as well, that was mentioned earlier on, sunshine would be the way to go, yeah? So um, not too much because again, um, you would worry about exposing your skin to too much rays and therefore other problems like, you know, melanoma, skin cancer, but um, 10 to 15 minutes um, in sort of late morning, middle of the day, um, afternoon would be fine. I'll go forward so that we don't see the wrong information again. And the last point I wanted to stress was not to smoke. And Dr. Manju said that earlier on, um, smoking increases your risk. So if you want good bone health, try not to smoke or at least cut down if you do have you know, problems uh, trying to stop in one go. So uh, elderly people or pe people of a certain age sometimes have reduced appetite. So in general, they're gonna eat less and um, their nutritional deficiencies and poor health would then set in. So try, and if you're a caregiver to uh, look out and make sure that you know, people with not that much of an appetite are still getting the macro and micronutrients that they need. And on a vegan or vegetarian diet, people are less likely to eat rich sources of vitamin B12. So if it's more abundant in animal foods, um, maybe supplements would help, yeah? Because you're not going to be uh, having access via that means. So, the last part was just to say, the food you eat can either uh, can be either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. It's a quote by Anne Whitmore. I thank you for your attention. Um, and if you have any questions, I suppose you'll be at the end uh, doing the panel uh, questioning. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Molina. And I really appreciated that you, you focused on the blue zones and really looking at when it comes to caring for our bone health and overall health, it's not about trendy diets. It's not about purchasing any products, that it's really about um, you know, local food that's pretty easily accessible, things that are affordable um, and that support our health in multiple ways at once. So um, I appreciated you pointing out as well that you know lentils and bean sources that no, not only are we taking care of our bone health, but we're also looking at intestinal health, heart disease, et cetera, um, and, and that these are all quite accessible. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Holly. Um, really quickly as a reminder to everyone, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see not only the chat, but also a Q&A function. So please feel free to submit any of your questions in the Q&A um, and we will address those both within the Q&A and then also during the panel discussion as well. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to um, Holly Niam, who is the owner and the head coach at Movement Labs um, here in Singapore. So Holly, handing it over to you. Good morning, folks. Um 
I'm so glad to be here. Can everyone hear me or can anyone hear me? <laughs> um, I'm actually shoved in the changing room in my studio right now because there are classes outside. I just finished teaching class and my kids are wreaking havoc at home. Um, actually, thank you, Dr. Uh, Manju, for your strong and great foundation for what we're about to discuss. And Dr. Melina, Adrian, your summary of what you loved about Dr. Melina's talk actually is a perfect introduction for me. Um, I think what you said is that she talked about things that were accessible, affordable, and that support many parts of your well-being. And we could copy paste that into the movement portion um, and talk. And, and that's exactly the, I mean, I didn't, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to be speaking about. Um, as a little bit of background, I did not give you 16 different titles and institutes that I'm a part of. Um, but actually, I, uh, my history is as a scientist. I have a PhD in biochemistry. I stepped away from the research bench about 10 years ago to start teaching and coaching movement. Um, it was much more, uh, a much better fit for my preferred lifestyle at that point. Um, and I will never go back to the research bench. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but I am so passionate and lucky to do the work that I do now. So academically, I could show you um, lots of slides about the importance of exercise, but practically speaking, that foundation has been laid. Um, and lots of times we know things are good for us, but it's the next step into making that happen that is really where the barrier comes up for people, right? Academically, I suspect that all 31 attendees here, plus all of the presenters, know that they should be exercising or moving. I don't need to convince you of that. Um, if, if I do, we can do that on the side. <laughs> but I think we all kind of know that. But rather, bringing that into practice is where we sort of get stuck. Um, and that is perhaps where you may see I'm going to sound a little different than a lot of the fitness professionals that you may have had exposure to in the past. Um, like I said, I've been working in the movement industry for in the and I, I choose the word movement because sometimes exercise or fitness feels a little bit intimidating or overwhelming. And I want it's a it's a reminder to all of us that movement matters. Um, and I'll come around to what that means, but there's a very specific specific reason I choose that uh, terminology when I talk about what I do. Um, I call myself a movement professional, not a personal trainer, um, most of the time. <laughs> um, and I, like I said, I started as a I started as a running coach, and that evolved into teaching yoga and Pilates and strength training. And of course, as with many of us, our careers evolve as our lives evolve. Uh, so the areas I focus in have shifted a little bit. And these days I typically work with folks who don't feel at home in a big gym. If you're going to a, a big box gym, means a, a, a chain gym or a community center, and you are doing great with your routine, perfect, then you, don't, you may not need me. <laughs> you may not need this pep talk. Um, but I tend to work with folks who may not feel at home there. I work a lot with pregnant women, postpartum women, and then women as they age. Um, my, my community and my space um, is not female exclusive, is not only women, but that tends to be who is attracted to the spaces that I work in. Um, and many times because of these populations, these are busy women. Um, my personal story, um, I am, okay, I'm not quite 40, but I'm looking it square in the eyes. So uh, I also parent two young children. I started my family a little bit on the later side. So I have a five-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, and I recognize that this group may be very diverse in the ages of their children, but I think what unites us is that we are all busy. We are caring for kids. We are caring for homes. We are caring for parents. And sometimes we're not caring for ourselves. Okay, again, this is not news to you, okay? People, the media shout this at us, self-care, self-care, self-care. And, um, but no one is bridging the gap into how we actually do that in a really practical and useful way, particularly when it comes to movement. Um, and so for myself, I was, an, and many of you may relate to this story. I was a gym goer, I was a runner, I was very active in movement. I had my kids, I had a business and things kind of ground to a halt and things got a lot harder. Uh, making time and uh, dedicating time for my own movement. And it was a reminder to me that what works for people when they're 20 years old doesn't necessarily work for them when they're 40 years old, right? And so what I hope to bring you today are some strategies and some ideas and some encouragement 
All right, I'm a coach. My job is to give a pep talk sometimes. Um, and so that's where we're going to end. But let's, let's take a step back. And I want you to think, um, you do not need to write anything in a chat box, but I want you to, if you have a pencil and paper nearby, grab that. If not, I want you to get really clear in your brain, okay, about the one or two things that are standing in your way of the movement that you want to do or of doing more movement, okay? Doing more exercise, if you wanna call it that. And I, want you to, I don't just mean like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I've got a few things in my head. No, I want you to think about one or two things that are really barriers for you right now, okay? And now I'm gonna read your mind, okay? Uh, as soon as I can share my screen, I'm going to read your mind. So here's the question, right? And I'm gonna assume we're screen sharing because my computer assures me we are. All right, so what are the common barriers? I am going to guess that some of you have written down, what do I do? I don't know what to do. There are too many options. There are these YouTube videos. There's this class at the, you know, some gym. There's the this, there's the that. I don't know what I should be doing, right? I want to preserve my bone health. I want to improve my balance. I want to stay cardiovascularly well, but I don't know what to do. Um, how do I do it? What if I do it wrong? What if I hurt myself? What if I'm not doing this right? What if I injure something and then I can't take care of my family the way that I need to? Um, how do I do it? Where do I do it? I don't have a gym membership. I can't afford a gym membership. I don't have the right equipment. I don't know where to get the equipment. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't have a place. This is a big one. When do I do it? I don't have the time. Okay. Um, this is, I'm guessing I'm hitting on a lot of the things that you may have be, be thinking or have written down because they're common. This is what I see in my studio and my space every day. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to remind you um, is that inaction begets inaction. If we keep putting up barriers, whether they're real or in our brains, we continue not doing anything. So what I really want to do today, now seven minutes into the time I've been speaking, is to talk about how do we break down those barriers? Because we know that movement is important. We know that exercise is important. We know that stimulus on the muscles makes them stronger that it reduces the risk of bone loss, it reduces the amount of bone loss, it improves our balance and reduces our risk of falling. We know these things. I'm, I'm guessing that probably 90% of the people that signed in for this seminar kind of knew that already, all right? But what do we do to bridge the gap between inaction and action? Because the good news is that action begets action. Small steps lead to bigger steps. Okay, so let's talk just briefly about breaking down those barriers. It is so common to let a barrier get big in our brains. Okay, I don't have any weights, so I can't do weight training. Okay, what I will tell you is that the way and the form that you move in is far more important than actually the load. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, so let's, let's get to breaking down some barriers. The what and the how. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'm doing it right. Okay, sometimes we need someone to speak the solution directly to our face, the problem and the solution directly to us uh, before we say, oh yeah, that's right, I get it. Yes, you're right. <laughs> because we tucked it back in our brains. So if you are not sure what to do or how to do it, all right, let's talk about that. Um, and I'm going to hand wave a few things here, but I will follow it up with support, okay? Um, because for me, the what and the how is super important. All right, I'm get, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop at this for just a moment. Um, if you step foot into my studio, you'll know that I'm very fussy on the form, on how we move, okay? Um, you do, uh, we do know that weight, we've, we've kind of seen on the slides, weight bearing movement, is good for building muscle and good for staving off bone loss or reducing bone density loss. Um, the most important aspect of that is your form. 
if you walk and hike and uh, any kind of, your body is a load. So if you're intimidated by the idea of picking up a weight, if you're doing movement with your body weight, there is huge benefit to that alone. Even if you never touch a dumbbell, there are awesome things about dumbbells and kettlebells, but if you never touch them, your body weight alone is a load. Okay. So you don't need lots of fancy stuff to get that stimulus. So when we look at what and how, I'm looking for resources that help you move with strong movement patterns. When your alignment is good, when your form is, um, is, is, is correct, we're loading bones, we're building muscles, and we're, you can see benefits from that. Even if you, like I said, you don't touch a resistance band or weight, um, which doesn't, I mean, this is very, that's very, that's very uh, individual, okay? So I always encourage folks to find some good resources, all right? Honestly speaking, this is not across the board, but usually you get what you pay for. So investing a little bit of money in a good resource is usually more successful than something you randomly find for free on YouTube. Lots of people put out good content, um, but the best stuff is often paid. There's a lot of crappy stuff that you pay for too, but um, my hope is that in some follow-up information, I can steer you towards some of the resources that I use and I recommend to my clients as far as trusted resources at several different price points, all right? Um, sometimes this looks like joining a remote coaching program. So you have chat access or video access to a coach. Okay. Um, the internet is amazing. COVID has locked so many people down. There are lots of great people working online. This is often more affordable than getting and, and faster than getting to a physical space. Okay. If you have the time and resources, working with someone who you can see in person is also really valuable. I'm not telling you stuff you don't know. I'm just holding it up for you to be reminded of. Okay, these are ways we can access the what and the how. And like I said, I do intend to follow this up in some of the information you receive after the session with some really practical, I'm not gonna throw a bunch of email uh, of um, websites up here now, that's not useful. Let's put them in an email where you can click on them, yeah? Um, what about the where? Where do I do this? I don't have space. I'm sure you have space. I'm sure you can make space to roll out a mat somewhere in your home, okay? Don't make it more complicated than it has to be. Most of these resources that I've just listed can be accessed in your space. Make that, make, make your space, your home where you do your movement. It saves you commute time, it sometimes saves you money, and it saves you time. <laughs> Um, with a little bit of equipment, a mat, maybe a resistance band, maybe a few dumbbells, this kind of equipment, if you're part of a program or working with a coach, they should be able to give you um, recommendations. Okay, I can't, this, these are my general recommendations for folks. This stuff you can probably get for about 60 to $80 total um, from Decathlon. Um, this is a small investment, yes. Uh, choose a space next to your bed, in a, in a, in a, on a, on, on your, on your balcony, um, on the void deck, right? It, choose a space. I will assure you uh, from COVID times, I have instructors that work for me broadcasting from all sorts of spaces next to their bed in their bedroom, wedged into the corner of the spare room that has a little bit of extra space. There is space, find it. If you need a video camera set up based on how you're consuming content, check that and make sure it's working. Again, the coach or the person you're working with should be able to give you some suggestions on that. Don't let the technology be a barrier. We're all Zooming you. You're all here. We're all Zooming. Okay, don't let that be a barrier. At a playground, do you play with your kids on a playground? Do you walk your dog? Do you get outside at all? There are, I love the playgrounds in Singapore. <laughs> As someone who grew up in the US and then moved here about 10 years ago, the playgrounds uh, in Singapore are amazing. There are bars to hang from, there are beams to balance on, um, there's so much possibility on the playground. There are people that are talking about playground workouts, right? Make this part of your life, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And when do you do it? This is a huge one. I don't have the time. I don't, I can't make the time. I have so many other things I'm doing. And I wanna remind you of a few things. The first one is that linking movement to what you're already doing matters. Um, this is like a habit building trick, okay? You don't need, do I put it, ah, this one. I should have started with that one. Start with something small, okay? 
um, previous Holly, Holly of like 10 years ago, thought that like, if I didn't have 45 minutes, it didn't count as a workout, that that wasn't worth it getting sweaty. It wasn't worth it to pick up the weight if I didn't have 45 minutes. Folks, if I have 10 minutes now, that's plenty. <laughs> Use the time that you have, all right? Or, or make that little pocket of time, okay? When my littlest one was little, I used to lay on the floor and do his tummy time, and I would do a little workout there because I was already laying on the floor, all right? I have people that I work with who practice their balance while they're brushing their teeth. They do a few um, stretches or some squats while their tea kettle is boiling, while they're waiting for the tea kettle to boil. This is not prescriptive. I'm not telling you what to do exactly. I'm suggesting to you that you think about what parts of your day give you space to sneak in a little bit of movement. Starting a brand new routine can be hard. Building a habit from scratch is hard. Stopping for 10 squats three times while you walk the dog, that's a lot easier because you're already walking the dog, right? Doing a few deadlifts while you wait for the tea kettle to boil, that makes sense because the tea kettle, you're already waiting for it, right? Um, these ways of sneaking in movement matter and they start to build patterns and habits and patterns are far more important for movement than any exercise routine I could give you, okay? Finding, making, dedicating the time and space to move is the biggest barrier for most of us, okay? And then there's a the bit of accountability. I often tell people that come into the studio that accountability is 50% of what I do as a coach and an instructor, okay? They say, I, I, I wish I had the discipline, I wish I had the, 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 the discipline or the, the planning so that I could do this on my own. And the reality is that you have it, but you're expending it in other places right now. Caring for your family, doing your job, caring for your home. So if you can have someone who, pro pardon me, provides you with a little support, the same way you provide support for your kids, for your spouse, for your parents, you deserve that support. You don't have to muscle through everything on your own, although we often think we do, okay? You have a finite reserve of discipline. And if you're using it in other areas, get somebody to help you. Someone you meet to go for a walk someone you meet at the playground and do some planks and squats, someone that, uh, a coach, sometimes it's paid accountability with a coach. I often remind folks that as a coach, I pay for a coach, okay? I pay someone to do for me what I do for people as job. Why? Because I don't do it for myself some, in some phases of my life, okay? There is no... I used to think that was, I used to be embarrassed by that, but there's no shame in that. You deserve support and accountability if you want to change a habit and need some help, okay? So maybe, again, I don't want you to write down all the stuff on this slide. I want you to think about one of the barriers that you listed. We're gonna come to one more, the last one, okay? And I want you to think if there's something actionable you can do, something here connected for you that you can take action on. It doesn't have to be, I don't want it to be revamping your whole life, okay? I want it to be one small actionable item that you can do to start to precipitate change, okay? And the last one is why. Why are we doing this? The first answer I often receive is not the deepest answer. We often immediately want to change our appearance, um, or change our size. And I'm gonna say that right up front. And I'm going to say that that is not a long lasting or effective motivator for change. What are effective motivators for change? I'm gonna poke you just a little bit deeper, right? Our why. What is your real why for making a change? My aim here is not to make you feel guilty or embarrassed or ashamed. My aim here is to help you connect to something that will help you stay motivated in the long term. What life do you envision as you age? This goes back to um, something that Dr. Melina said. You don't wanna wait until it's the last moment to try to make a change. Can you make a shift now? What do you want your children and your grandchildren to remember about you? 
My answer is not yours, but my answer is I want to remember the play we do. I want to remember them playing with me outside, exploring, climbing, hiking, running. That's what I want my children to remember. So I work to keep my body in a place I can do that. What memories do you want to make now? Do you want to do a hike? Do you want to be able to lift something heavy? Do you want to be able to do a, what is your, what, what, what do you want to do now? And how do we build a body that will support that? And that again, feeds into this last one. What will the future you thank today's you for? Building that mini habit that grows to a bigger habit. Getting the foundation of a squat so you can load it up and do your best squat ever when you're 55. Um, be able to walk without pain now so that you can hike Hong, in Hong Kong when we can fly again, right? What is you in five, 10, 15 years going to thank the you now for? That's a long time. Start small, build from there. And so I'm actually going to, um, to give you a little bit of practical, um, one little practical, well, like I said, I'm gonna follow up with a little bit more information, but I'd also like to invite you all to bring this into practice later this week. Um, I'm gonna be offering a free 30 minute session for folks that are signed up for the seminar today um, on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. This is going to be another Zoom session that's run by myself in my, uh, I'll, be, I'll be broadcasting it on Zoom. You do this at home with stuff you already have. Um, you'll get some more information about that when you register. And I'm going to leave you that at the end of that session with a simple takeaway workout. Because it's great for me to sit here and say all this stuff, but what does that mean for you later? What does that mean for you tomorrow or next week? Right. I want to give you something to take away. In fact, when uh, Adrian uh, first uh, approached me about this, she had said, maybe you can do it. Or someone had said, can you do a little workout? And I said, I don't know if I can do a workout in 10 or 15 minutes and address all this other stuff. Can we do the workout later in your home? Can we help build this habit? Can we start? Can I show you the possibility? Can I see you live to coach you? That's what I want to know. And that's what I invite you to engage with. It will also be available on video, um, obviously no live coaching, but I'll make the video available to you for a week after the session. So uh, you'll be getting some follow-up information with how you can sign up for this. I'd encourage you to join me um, if you can. We will work through boundaries and limitations. My specialization is making this feel accessible to you because I want you to walk away feeling well. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share for a moment and just finish with a really tiny pep talk because that's what I do, as I said, as a coach, pep talk is my specialty. Um, and I want you to remember three things from this portion, all right? I want you to remember that you're not broken. You're not broken now. If you have an osteoporosis diagnosis, you're not broken then. You're not broken if you break a wrist. I mean, your wrist is broken, but you are not broken, all right? We can always work with something, okay? Remember that you can benefit from support. The same support you provide to other people in your life, you deserve, okay? It, it is normal to need support and it's okay to let someone else care for you. And the third thing is that you, third, third, you're allowed to prioritize movement you enjoy, okay? I specifically did not give you a lot of details and facts about movement because the most important thing to start is that you move a walk, uh, some squats, some uh, playing on the jungle gym with your kids. If you're carrying your body weight, that's better. But if swimming appeals to you, go ahead. The more weight you're, if you carry your body weight, you're better from a bone health perspective, but just move, do something you enjoy. This isn't a punishment. It should be a vehicle for feeling empowered in your body. So please move somehow, some way maybe with me on Wednesday, maybe in your own timing, okay? That's what I want you to walk away with, a little bit of encouragement and possibility for movement. With that, I'm gonna wrap up my portion um, and turn things back over to Adrian. But I hope that you step into that invitation as your, uh, and, and, and start breaking down your own barriers so that you can step into some movement that may snowball into more movement and bring you more of the things that you want from your life. Thank you for sticking with me. That's your pep talk. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Holly. And what I really appreciate is the um, the emphasis on starting where you are, not where you want to be. And so, so whether it's in the the when or making the space or um, uh, fitting it into life, that it's really based on on where people are today. Um, and also, as another dynamic to that as well, is I just want to add in the um, the importance of the social aspects of exercise sometimes as well is how if we can combine the social with um, with movement then you know we're also meeting we're essentially meeting two needs at once um, and so i want to we just have 15 minutes left here and there's been some great questions that have come in through the q a um, dr dr manju and dr molina have been very busy answering some of these questions and what I want to do is, you know, a few of these fall into um, a kind of a higher level theme of um, questions about Asian diets. So um, one person has brought up that um, many many Asians are lactose intolerant. Um, so uh, Dr. Molina has highlighted some of the um, some of the the foods that can be eaten for for calcium and vitamin D as well that aren't just dairy. Um, and there's also a question about, um, uh, you know, are there, are there particular Asian diets that put you more at risk of osteoporosis and less? So I'm just going to quickly open this up to Dr. Molina again, is can you address a couple of these questions publicly as well, as far as when we look at, look at Asian diets, um, what people are eating is what are some of these other foods um, that people can be eating beyond dairy? I know you addressed it in your presentation, but just highlighting it again. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Molina. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Adrian. If um, one is lactose intolerant and um, there are other sources of calcium, um, you can have, you know, green leafy vegetables, uh, pulses and legumes, a lot of whole grains as well. And um, tofu and tempeh, all the fermented foods as well that are it's essentially made from, you know, soy, which is the beans and the uh, lentils and stuff that we were talking about. Um, the added advantage of the fermented products is for your gut uh, microbiome as well. So unless, you know, one is intolerant to soy um, or other, you know, things, there's, you can have oat milk, you can have other forms of milk that are not milk, uh, non-dairy products, and um, that should be fine. The other form we said earlier on was um, canned oily fish in the forms of sardine or mackerel, where the bones are extremely soft and brittle, and that could be your intake for calcium. You wouldn't want to eat it every day because you'd be sick of that, but you know, once in a while, just to um, revive certain things that we don't eat so often and um, provide a variety of sources of food rather than the same ones all the time. If I may add, uh, um, I mean, when you're talking about local sources, ikan bilis, um, you don't really have to go and buy canned uh, uh, tuna and you know, canned uh, um, uh, sardines. Ikan bilis is a great source of uh, um, uh, calcium. Um, of course, I mean, you know, the dried ikan bilis, I mean, it's quite salty, so you do have to kind of keep that in mind. But um, again, look at locally available sources easily from the wet market or from any neighborhood uh, shop that you can get. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Manju. Um, that also is rich in phosphorus and other exactly. minerals. Yeah. yeah, so the it, only thing is that the, the salt, you know, you know, it's very salty, but, you know, small quantities. Uh, um, two or three times a week, you know, should be very good for you. Mm -hmm. And all the small little fish that you find in nasi lemak, the salak kuning and all that, they're all deep fried and you can actually eat the, the head to the tail because exactly. it's actually crispy. So all the bones are in there. Yeah. Um, uh, Adrian, if I may kind of, because I think there were quite a few questions on supplements versus, and, you know, and um, uh, versus diet. Um, if I may kind of bring that up, because I think that's important. Um, like, I do want to emphasize again and again that um, some people say, oh, I have, you know, I eat calcium rich food, you know, I mean, you know, I go out and exercise, but still I do have, I have osteoporosis. So, like I said, 
not all osteoporosis is preventable. 20% uh, of uh, um, you know, your bone health, you can modulate with diet and exercise, diet and lifestyle changes. But when it comes to supplements, it is very important to remember that, again, we emphasize that the best source of calcium is from dietary sources. It's only if you really cannot, I mean, if you hate milk, if you hate all sorts of dairy, you can't stand tofu, you shudder the thought of tofu, you know, those kind of people are very old people who cannot take, uh, you know, enough of calcium rich uh, foods that we recommend um, supplements. Um, so supplements in excess um, has been associated with side effects such as kidney stones and even a risk of uh, heart attacks and all that. But then again, that is an excess. Uh, but from the diet, um, so far, um, calcium from the diet has not been associated with the um, side effects. Um, so that's one important thing to um, uh, remember. I think what I, what, I, what I appreciate and what I love is that the, um, the other suggestions for you know, foods beyond dairy that have calcium are some of the most affordable things at the wet market. So leafy greens and tofu and the smaller fish is these are, um, and so, so it makes it a lot easier to incorporate into the diet as well and make it um, something daily. So whether it's throwing, you know, throwing greens into soups or, or putting it as a side dish, it makes it, makes it easy and affordable. Um, there's also, Holly, there are a couple questions specific to weight training. And I think that is interesting um, specifically because a lot of times I think, you know, we, we gravitate towards the cardio, um, less on the weight training. And so if you could um, answer a couple of these questions around how to incorporate, incorporate weight training and if people are having some challenges with weight training, I mean, personally, the things that I could do at 20 are not what I can do at 42. Um, as far as, you know, I might feel joint pain or, um, or the strength work might be, I, I, I have different limitations thanks to these two little beasts in my house. So, um, yeah, if you could, if you can. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm scrambling to listen to answers and type answers here a little more specific to each question, but broadly speaking, I would say a couple of things. Um, as far as putting together a general, I emphasize in the talk that some movement is better than no movement. Um, however, if you're already doing some movement, looking at a mixture of uh, things that are a little bit more cardio based, that would be your walking, your hiking, maybe you're running, you're swimming, um, things that are a little more um, strength based, whether it's body weight or with external weight, and then things that are a little bit more stretch based. Um, those are the three elements that we look at in terms of a well-rounded program when you're ready for that kind of next step, right? So I know there was one question about I'm doing like HIT, high intensity. If you're really doing HIT, it's high intensity interval training every day and I'm always sore, right? Um, I used to be able to do it or do other things every day as, as, as Adrian just said, and I can't. The reality is um, our bodies take longer to repair and recover from workouts and we have more demands. We're probably sleeping less than we did in our 20s. We, oh, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, we are, uh, we have a lot of other external stressors, right? And it's all stress on the body, whether it's emotional, um, physical, whatever, it's all stress on our body. So recovery time is slower. So my suggestions when you're finding yourself a little bit stuck or constantly sore are to vary your, uh, a couple of suggestions. Um, first, if you're always doing kind of strength training movements, get assessed by a professional um, for your form. Because if, you're, if, you're, if your form is not good and you're compensating in other ways, you may never really be recovering and you may not be putting the stress on your body that you want to put on to build muscle and to increase bone density, right? So make sure that you're getting assessed by someone who will really check that out for you. You. not just tell you to go faster and stronger and harder, but really make sure that your form is tuned in. Okay. Second thing is to vary. If you're doing weight training or high intensity work every day, alternate that with something like a walk or some stretching, maybe give yourself that extra day to recover. If you're never recovered, you're not doing any benefit to yourself. Right. Um, so more is not always merrier. Uh, that's what I tell my folks when they're moving. Um, so vary the kind of movement that you're doing. Let me see. Um, and then if you consistently experience significant fatigue, muscle ache for things that you don't feel sync with 
what you're actually doing, then there's always space for an assessment by a physician just to make sure that everything else is in order, that, you know, that, that all of your, your hormone levels, your, your uh, nutrient levels, that everything is balanced, is kind of balanced. There's no extern, there's no other reason that you might be experiencing this, but form, variety, and then, and, and, and not necessarily, you know, order depends on your personal situation. I can't tell you which one you should do first, but, you know, vary the, vary the type of workout you're doing. Um, uh, give yourself some recovery time and perhaps, you know, there may come a time when seeking out a physician, um, uh, just a, just a physical kind of assessment would be appropriate. Is that okay? Yeah. And I, I just have to say, you know, one thing that I'm really learning from the questions that we're getting across is, and this is something that we, we talk about quite a bit about, um, in our, in our preparations for this webinar series with wings and within access health is how this period of life in the 40s tends to be kind of overlooked by the healthcare system, so to speak, as there aren't really those touch points of where do I ask these questions? Um, you know, how do I, it, 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 especially in, you know, potentially around primary care settings is I'm not getting, there's not a, um, a, a certain thing I'm being seen at the doctors for. I don't need to, there's not a condition that I have to go be seen for, et cetera, but I'm looking at how do I improve improve my health and that some of this can be very personal, some of it can be, um, they know that it applies to many people, but how this is um, an important, important, uh, uh, that this is, this is an important thing. Um, and I think Dr. Molina has a little bit more that she would like to share as well. So I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Molina. Um, thank you, Adrian. I just um, wanted to say that, um, those of you, I assume that most of our audience is feminine and mothers with children. I am in my 56th year with um, three grown up children. The eldest is 31 and they live and work in various parts of Europe and Africa. Um, and I think that the, the message is you're not too old to start, but if you do start and you get your children into the mode of moving eating, sleeping, any form of, you know, good habits, it's a lot easier than later, but it's again, never too late. Last year, I was called by the Singapore National um, Olympic Council and they said, we need an old lady to do sports and we're gonna film her. And would, could you be one of them? And I said, well, what, 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 how old is old? And they said, um, 46 to 70 plus. So I sort of fell in the middle of being 55 at the time. And so I was in a, you know, little dance room doing ballet in, of all things, the only leotard I had left was a one with horizontal stripes. So it looked horrendous um, with all the bulges and stripes everywhere going haywire. And then a swimming sort of thing that they filmed uh, just to tell other people that you're not too old to do that. But the only swimming costume I had left was a two piece with the arena all chipped off on the top and um, my stretch marks in between. I thought, I don't really care. It's, it's not the packaging, but what you actually do with your body, right? So all of us who are a little bit self-conscious as well due to age, due to body shape, due to, we may not have the most fancy equipment that we're wearing to do our sports and our stuff. Don't worry too much about that. Just start like holly says you know we just get on with it and it's fine um so don't don't be hung up about uh, all the external things that we might want to have perfect before we start doing something yeah thank you well all i can say is melina you look fabulous <laughs> you know at uh, 56 i thought i was the oldest person in the room so at 52 but uh, you look amazing um, so yeah, I, I agree. There's no specific age at which, you know, you, there's no too old age, really. Um, um, uh, can Edrin, can I just, again, because I'd say, uh, mentioned in the, the Q&A that I would like to answer it live, uh, there was this question about hormone replacement therapy um, after menopause and uh, whether the person should take hormone replacement therapy or whether they can just take calcium and uh, vitamin D and exercise. Um, again, this is because it's a public forum, I can't answer specific questions, specific, you know, individual um, uh, kind of questions related to medications, but hormone replacement therapy after menopause has indicated uh, for those people who have 
uh, menopausal symptoms such as hot flashes and uh, vaginal dryness, etc. It has a great additional benefit in that it helps uh, um, uh, prevent bone loss, but it's not for everybody. So it's not like as soon as you hit menopause, you should take hormone replacement. Again, that has to be a decision which you have to uh, uh, base, uh, make uh, based on discussions with your doctor. Um, uh, and uh, um, a, a good, healthy lifestyle is extremely important, uh, true. Um, uh, but it, one doesn't replace the other. Um, there are indica specific indications for hormone replacement therapy. Um, and that should be something which you should discuss with your doctor. Thank you. And we've just, you know, thank you for addressing that. And um, the, I think, you know, between everyone's final comments, it really wraps up that the, really our big takeaways is that it is important to develop these healthy habits, even if it's small changes that add up over time. Um, that this, any of our concerns are things that we should be addressing with our doctors, um, with your primary care physicians or any of your women's health um, doctors that you're seeing as well. And not to be afraid to reach out for support, whether that support is social support or it is with a professional, um, but to, to, to prioritize your, your health needs as well um, and to, to reach out for that support um, if needed. And so I'm going to, and we'll all be, I know the Access Health team, we will be joining Holly's session um, next Wednesday at eight o'clock. And also the, you know, we have two more, um, two more events in the, in the series. So here's a QR code to sign up for the next one um, on March 6th. And this is when we're gonna be looking at specifically around menopause. And not just about, I think a lot of times, you know, women have questions about menopause right when they're hitting menopause, or that's when um, a lot of times these, these questions are addressed. But we know there's quite a long time period beforehand where we're pre-menopause, um, you know, women are experiencing various changes as well. Um, so we're going to be, the next webinar is going to basically be all questions menopause. Um, pre, during, and post. So please come back and join us next Saturday as well. And, uh, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again to Holly, Dr. Molina, and Dr. Manju for, for taking the time today. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful session. Learned a lot, too. Thank you. Take care, Lovely everyone. Meeting all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.